Fantastic. So <laughs> there's all sorts of memes about people talking about computer science and can't work their laptop <laughs> for. <laughs> so, um, so well, uh, you know, thank you for allowing me. Uh, you know, time is precious, and thank you for allowing me to come in and have a conversation with you uh, about some topics that I'm, I'm deeply um, uh, that I'm deeply passionate about. Uh, yeah, we're good to go. Thanks. Um, so uh, uh, I, I've taken a weird uh, route through uh, through medicine. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, you know, I have to throw this up here because I'm on faculty at a couple schools and they require you to do disclaimers. I'm not here to promote any particular commercial product. Um, and I also make frequent use of stuff that I clip from the pictures from the internet. I don't make any claim that I'm the original author of them. I th throw in the references in there when I do, and anytime I'm doing that stuff, I'm doing it under the fair use doctrine. <laughs> so I have to throw that in there. <laughs> Anyone know what kind of spider that is? It's, it's called, it's big, yeah, it's a big <laughs> spider. <laughs> it's a huntsman spider. It's actually quite, it's a very tame spider. They don't, they're, they're very shy. They don't like to mess with humans. So just to, you know, I, it, if, if I say things, I, I mean, I know we got serious scientists in the room, so, you know, if I say stuff that's sort of great on you, like how's this gynecologist talking about these things, just, just think of it like you're watching a chicken playing the piano. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's entertaining, right? To, you know, if, <laughs> if for no, if no other thing, it's not the virtuoso music. It's just kind of interesting to hear a gynecologist talk about stuff. I, I'm, I'm going to skip through the slide. It's just an, a quick overview what uh, topics I hope to touch on. Um, if you notice down at the bottom of the screen, it, it talks about three challenges. And so we've got some people who have some entrepreneurial ideas or people coming on the ground floor of information sciences. Maybe these are things that you would like to tackle um, uh, along with me. So let's get going to the next. Uh, we've already gone over that, but I, I do want to mention that um, I spent a lot of time as a person plowing through lots of grants, lots, and actually putting out broad agency announcements. And um, so I kind of know how the sausage is made in DC. So I just mentioned that because, you know, one of the things that Alan Russell and, and Lynn wanted me to emphasize with the group is if people have stuff that, and they feel like they're banging their head against the door with the government don't I mean don't don't feel like you you have no allies in this I'm I'm more than happy to to share knowledge about I don't know how helpful that's going to be but some knowledge about sort of how to get your great idea in front of the eyes who will recognize it as a great idea and will also give you constructive criticism when it's not necessarily a great idea for the government because you know sometimes it's hard to imagine what what the needs are at any given time can you maybe tell the audience just briefly what it's like to be the medical advisor in such a high-ranking position what that means uh, logistically and what that means from an innovation standpoint what you were sort of responsible for doing well so as a medical scientist, that's kind of this part of my, this is sort of a, a using a Fibonacci sequence, kind of the, um, the, my, my life uh, sort of in the research world kind of working in a spiral outward. And what Lynn's talking about is this part of my career where I was a medical sciences advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and by extension to the Secretary of Defense on critical medical science issues. So they had staff you know, the, 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 there were surgeons general. The, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff had a staff surgeon whose role was mostly policy. My job was to find best of breed science to attack the most pressing medical science issues that were really bearing down on us. Post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, complex polytrauma, suicidality. And I was, I was in a unique role in as much as that the leader that I served, Mike Mullen, who's you can barely make him out here, but he's, he's right here doing my promotion ceremony. Uh, he, he was a system scientist. He had an actual master's degree in system science from Naval Postgraduate School. And so he understood that in order to get system solutions, not only do you have to have a full 360 degree knowledge of what's going on 
in, in all places, battlefield, back in the States, VA, whatever. But you had to be able to understand how to, how to improve systems and in a very non-military way. Militaries are built on hierarchies and if you take a hierarchical approach, it'll take you forever. Uh, system solutions generally try to find single point of failure or try to find various things will optimize the entire system. And so that's what he, that's the role I played. So he found somebody who was a like-minded systems thinker who wasn't very hierarchical. I was, I was very much a maverick, very much a, a radical seen as such within the military. And he took a big chance on hiring me. I mean, everybody said, no, 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 don't do it. And in the end, I, I think we really made some, some great inroads. But it was the greatest honor of my life. He was the best boss I'll ever have. Um, and it was a magical time for me because I really do think that we made significant inroads in a lot of, very quickly in a lot of very difficult areas. So all I can say is it was, it was amazing. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do and it was the most magical, wonderful thing as well. And I've done a lot of really cool stuff. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's my career sort of in a snapshot. I think actually, I, I said that was the coolest thing. I think really the coolest thing I did just above this 9-11 first responder thing here. Uh, I was a bullfight doctor for a day in Mexico City, <laughs> which was cool. <laughs> but we don't have enough time for me to go into. Hopefully they didn't need your skills that they day. They didn't that day. The week before was bad. Two guys got gored. But wow. actually, the worst injury was a guy getting thrown about 10 feet in the air and getting a concussion. But that was it. OK. So anyway, I'm, I'm living in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I'm born, born in Carlisle. My parents actually met and got at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, my grandfather was a barber on Fifth Avenue here in Pittsburgh. But I grew up in Carlisle, and I live in Lancaster, PA. I have a little farm, and, uh, and I, I run a tech startup and a, a busy medical practice. And did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> did you know about, just a little quick advertisement about <laughs> Lancaster, PA. It's like the coolest town. It is really cool. It's got so many layers to it. Yeah, we got the, um, everyone knows the Amish and the all-you-can-eat buffets. But we also have we also have this dark, sinister 450 square foot facility where every virtually every rock star makes a pilgrimage to to build their sets for their touring shows. It's called Rock Lit It, and it's got some of the best you know uh, electrical engineers and so on on the planet building these massive stage systems for television and touring uh, audiences. And it's all under these, uh, these roofs that look like uh, they're building the next space shuttle, but it's actually stage shows. And then in addition to that, if you have a Rolex watch, they're all repaired in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The ad agency for BMW. I could go on and on. There's a lot of right? this. Field trip, field trip. <laughs> plus, it's uh, a Forbes magazine number one for retiring to. And in the top ten list for gay men, too, because of the art scene and, and the foodie scene uh, there. And it's it's four, a fabulous place. It's a great. It's a it's great. But everyone thinks it's funny because we're outside of Philadelphia, and when I transfer patients to the University of Pennsylvania, they treat me like I'm an idiot, like it's cow town. Like you guys are like, oh, yeah, you're cow doctors, aren't you? And it's like, no, we're Lancaster. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway I have to throw that in there. I love Lancaster. I love living there. This is my medical practice, and we use the most advanced. It's, I literally have the Ferrari of ultrasound machines. We do some incredible work. We do 3D printing in our, in our lab downstairs. I mean, so we, we, were, we believe ourselves to be second to none in the care of, um, of uh, women with uh, complicated uh, pregnancies and or who themselves have comp complications, cancers, heart disease, diabetes. And we even take our practice on the road. So the Amish don't drive, or well, most of them don't drive. Um, and because of that, uh, it's important to be able to take medicine to them. And believe me, they have a lot of, there are a lot of genetic issues and other things that, and they're quite savvy about it. They're not, they don't eschew modern medicine, uh, but they, uh, but we very often have to take modern medicine out to them. And so I have a mobile unit that I also use. Um, that's my little lab downstairs. I'm just going to skip through that. Um, so I, I did say that, um, that I was going to talk, talk to you about how uh, there's a danger in being a bit too superficial about 
about science, so I'm going to, how we can at least leverage some of the stuff that's a, a bubbling up in other parts of the tech industry, perhaps leverage it for medicine for the common good. And with, without, um, without uh, necessarily having any romantic notions about where, where medicine has been, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. This is my sort of top ten list of, of the top ten areas where medicine needs to innovate. And you'll notice at the bottom, it's not really a tech thing. It's about doctors and about medicine in general, that we, that they're, we need to reconnect with our humanity, which is something that has been lost in medicine, I think. And, um, and it's not irrecoverable. And you're going to think this is kind of strange, but just as I believe that tech has, to some degree, stripped away the humanity of medicine, it has the potential to re-imbue medicine with more humanity if applied correctly. It's just, it's a matter of application. Anyone ever seen this movie, Silent Running? It's I, I highly recommend it. Uh, George Lucas took all the special effects people off of this film, which was, pr which was distributed about a year and a half before Star Wars. And that's why Star Wars is such a great movie, because they, they worked out all the bugs on this movie. But anyway, this is actually really cool. It's with Bruce Dern, and it's a cool movie. Okay, so this is, um, this is a, 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 a painting that for a very long time has been sort of revered in the medical profession as sort of the quintessential, this is what, who we are, this is what doctors are. And just a quick uh, background about it. This is in the Tate collection. Tate actually asked the artist, uh, paint me something that speaks to my soul. You can do any subject. Here's three uh, three thousand pounds, which is was back then 150 years ago was a huge amount of money, right? Just artist, make me a painting that speaks to my soul. Any topic. So the artist actually picked a moment of his life when his three-year-old daughter died. In, he imagined in making this painting that, that his daughter had lived and that the doctor had saved his daughter's life, but he wanted to kind of lionize the doctor um, as this very thoughtful uh, person who's just exerting all their brain power but is still very human, very, you know, at the bedside. Um, and and uh, I don't know if you can make this out, but the, art, this, the artist put himself both here as the dad and some of his facial features here, but this triangle here going on, here's mom praying that her, her daughter lives. Um, you can see some, some things that the daughter is gr gravely ill. Medicine out in the corner and then the doctor, very, very intensive brain power, thinking about what medicine, what do I do, how do I save this life. Um, that's a very romantic notion about medicine. Um, wish it were true. Um, there are a lot of elements there that are true. I can tell you that as a person who's been practicing 30 years, I still sit at the bedside. I still agonize over what to do. I still, my gut constantly worries about patients as they leave the hospital, as they come into the hospital. The doctor's life is not a comfortable one, despite what you might think. It's a, a life of worry. Um, it's not carefree. And part of the problem is, is that there's no, really no solution to this problem. A doctor has a desire to be this all-encompassing, all-thinking, all-knowing person to solve problems. But in the end, every doctor knows that no doctor is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-thinking, whatever, and has to work collaboratively. But they also know that doctors, personality types-wise, generally tends to get in the way. So there's a lot of behind the scenes, there's a lot of, you know, head-butting, not only amongst each other, but with hospital administrators and the ever-growing negative influence of electronic medical records and so on. So the, probably the most, um, the most famous of all uh, doctors on, uh, in, in the near modern era is Sir William Osler, and he said that about, about uh, doctors and knowing everything, that you really can't know everything. Well, I think the beautiful thing about the conversations that we have here at the Disruptive Health Technology Institute and on campus in general is sort of this idea that the art of medicine, which is very much part of the humanity and the relationship of, of a doctor's wisdom coupled with their experience and skill, but then AI and data and all of these things really augmenting that art for better outcomes for patients. And in some ways, 
a, a better experience for physicians. So I think part of what's exciting about your ideas is this, to me, this beautiful melding of the art and humanity of being a medical professional with all of the technology because they can't live sort of in isolation from one another. Exactly, and, and just like going back to that Monty Python thing, the devil's in the details. So we all know that playing a flute involves blowing on one end and moving your fingers up and down the other, but the, but the difference between making noise and making, you know, uh, Mozart's Die Zauberflaute or whatever and playing beautifully has to do with how, it, how the in between, how it's done, mm -hmm. okay? And so, uh, and so hopefully we'll, we'll get a little bit more into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how it's done. I do want to point out that, that there is a school of thought that says, well, the problem, the, it's a real problem for a doctor to have too much emotion, that you're probably better off being a sociopath because, uh, because then you just don't worry why you're cutting people open and doing that stuff. I, I'm not, I don't belong to that school of thought. Okay, just truth in advertising, but that is a school of thought, right? That it's you know the best best doctors are really good sociopaths. I really don't want people making life and death decisions who who have as much concern for my child as they have concern over the ham sandwich they're going to eat at, at midday. Okay, so anyway, but that's a that is a school of thought. Um, th this does have a toll on physicians. It's the it's as a profession, it's the highest rate of suicide of all of the main professions. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's a disproportionately high rate amongst uh, female physicians. So for, for, for whatever reason, it's a, it has more, and, and you know, I won't get into all the sociological about it, but it's, but it's a real problem. It's a real problem. And, it's, and physician burnout, more than half of American physicians are burned out by every survey that's been done. All right? So that's, that's not good when these are the people that are supposed to be captain of the ship taking care of your health. So how do you, does anyone know what animal that is? By the way? You're close. So it's half of a yak. It's called a zoo. So zoos are low altitude yaks. So a zoo is a half yak, half cattle. And you use them at lower altitude because they can carry the burden and do fine. But they get pulmonary edema just like humans if they go too high. So you, you, this is the yak transfer point. This is right about 14, 15,000 feet. There is a yak in the background. You actually, yeah, you did spot the yak. So the yak is a, so this is a yak transfer point. So yaks are really na nasty animals. They're mean, they're nasty, they smell bad, and they, they're dumb, and they attack you when you're not looking. <laughs> so you have to watch out. Zoku are much more, I mean, the zoos are, are much, kinder animals. But anyway, but they, they don't do well at high altitude and yaks do really lousy at low altitude. Okay. All right, so one way you can distribute the load is do this fancy telemedicine stuff and it's been dreamed of and anybody who knows much about telemedicine has seen that picture far to my right, which is you know, envisioning telemedicine in the 1920s and it's amazing how prescient it was because it's got a doctor talking through a telescreen and examining a patient and that's basically how telemedicine is done to this day. Um, there were early experiments in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, kind of trial and error, and we still haven't gotten telemedicine right. That's me in Bosnia doing telemedicine during the war there. Um, and then a little bit later in the 90s, I was doing telemedicine off Mount Everest, and I show this picture as a way to talk about how the dumb things about telemedicine. So people think about telemedicine as being a really smart doctor telling a really dumb doctor how to do things or a really smart doctor telling some para-provider para how to get things right. Kind of like that scene, in the, again, going back to that Monty Python thing. You can become a really smart doctor, and then when, when you discover cure for all, you know, your disease, you can tell everybody how to get everything right, and it cures the world of all known diseases. That is telemedicine in a nutshell today. The idea that you have doctor at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center telling dumb person out in you know, Danville, Pennsylvania, or some some place, how to how to get their you know their act together, when in fact, um, if you know much about networks, the way you get a network to really improve the entire network is that you have multiple nodes across the network have expertise across the network, and the entire network, as an emergent property of the network, it, it the, all boats rise rather than this hub and spoke where you got really smart person here 
One, because it's, it's not all that much more efficient than just flying the person to, to the center, okay, which a lot of, behind the scenes, a lot of hospitals use telemedicine to do nothing more than to cherry pick the most expensive cases and bring them in, you know, for the more expensive procedures. But um, in our experience on Everest, for instance, we had this climber and he summited Everest and he had pneumococcal pneumonia. And we diagnosed him with that and we were doing telemedicine conferences back with Yale. And no dig against Yale University, but the doctors and the group of experts back there were telling us, no, it's high to pulmonary edema. And we finally had to say, okay, here's the punchline, guys. We already did the slides. We already did the gram stain. We've seen the, the, the pneumococcus on the gram stain. The, ki the guy has <laughs> pneumococcal pneumonia. He doesn't have pulmonary edema. And, uh, but it was kind of a point where we're, the experts supposedly were at Yale, but the experts, including Ken Kamler, my, my partner in that uh, medical tent, were two of the best experts at high altitude medicine, not the other way around. Not these people who'd never been, they'd never been to Pikes Peak in a, in a, in a car, let alone climb the mountain. Okay, so, uh, so we're going to, you know, I know that wisdom of crowds is something that has been a topic here at Carnegie Mellon. It's a, it's a, it's not a new topic. It's a, it's actually, a, you know, if we go back to somebody like Galton, it's a, it's a very old topic, but I think a very misinterpreted topic because, and it goes back to the original story about Galton and the wisdom of crowds. So for those of you who don't know this story, you know, Galton was one of the founders of biostatistics along with Fisher and Pearson and some other people, all at the same time, contemporaries of each other. And what he did was he went to this uh, fair in Plymouth uh, and there was a, a steer that was for auction, but then you, if you could guess the exact weight of the steer, you could have the steer, you know. And what he did was he just sampled nearly 800 people, averaged that, and came up with a number that was only one pound off from the actual number. And, this, and, and people who do Wisdom of Crowds talks will put a jar of jelly beans or some other thing, and, and mysteriously the crowd always seems to be able to figure out the numbers of items in a, or the pounds or the weight or, or whatever, because as a, as a demonstration that the crowd can, at coming together, find a, a salient piece of information about the object. Um, th that sometimes gets misinterpreted that all you need to do is, that wisdom of crowds is all about averages. And I want to shatter that myth a little bit. Um, it, it has more to do with the emergent properties of the crowd, not just a simple mathematical trick, okay? And I'm going to go back to the wisdom of crowds that aren't human. So um, we, we know that creatures, uh, in this case, these are ants. This is a, this is a bullet ant. This is being the Amazon. And bullet ants build their, their nests at the base of trees. Anyone know what kind of tree that is, by the way? How many people seen trees in a hotel lobby that look like that? You've all seen, you've all seen this species of tree in a hotel lobby somewhere. No, it's not. It's not. It's not a palm. It's a ficus. It's a ficus tree. It's a fig tree. It's a variant of the fig tree, right? It's a, it's a ficus tree. And actually, that was a small one in the Amazon. There were ones that were three times that diameter, or a thousand years old. Okay. So anyway, but the bullet ant is called a bullet ant because if you get bitten by it, it feels like somebody shot you with a bullet. No kidding. And they're, they're a little, about an inch long, and they're very painful. They, they, they make nests about 900. It's mostly a colony of soldiers that go out and forage during the day. They're not nearly as sophisticated as, say, for instance, army ants or, you know. So, so ants, despite their tiny, tiny, tiny brain, can group together, and, and actually the, the real performers, the ones that are really um, show amazing emergent properties, ants, are, ants and termites are, are, are a couple. Bees really are incredibly impressive. In that, and there's been a lot studied about what bees can do. They, they can collectively heat and cool their home location. They can actually count. They can pass geospatial information to each other. They, as a collective, they have the abilities to do many things 
that humans find difficult. In, for instance, rec recognizing complex um, uh, geometric structures and so on and so forth, all because they can collectively bring, bring their intelligence together in a collective. They also, people fail to realize that how important bees are to the world economy. So about a third of a trillion dollars of the world economy is dependent on, on bees and other pollinators that are brought in for agriculture. Okay, so, um, so back to this thing about wisdom of crowds not necessarily being about drawing a statistic, drawing a, you know, a mean, median, and mode, and that's, that demonstrates wisdom of crowds, because that's a very kind of very simplistic. It's an important starting point to talk about wisdom of crowds, but it's not it's not really the, it, if you want to have a more sophisticated understanding about wisdom of crowds, I think this is a great example. And this was, how many people have heard about, about Kasparov versus the world? Anyone? But, yeah. So what's really cool about this is it was an early experiment in the internet. I mean, this is back in the late 90s. And what they did was they brought 50,000 users online with varying degrees of understanding of chess, but none of whom had any, were anywhere e even near the class. They weren't grandmasters. They were just basically chess players. They had four really good chess players, none at the grandmaster level. And then they had a computer making decisions about the moves. And so what they did was the computer and the four good chess players or excellent chess players, they weren't grandmaster, they weren't even near grandmaster, they made nominations to the 50,000 people, and then they voted on the moves. Kasparov almost lost this game, came very close. He had to completely radicalize his play far more than he'd ever had to, and he said it was the hardest game he ever played, and this was in the late 90s. My point here is that what ended up happening, and I don't even think he quite understood this, if you read his book, is that what they created was an engineered system involving humans and machines, right? So you had a computer, you had a group of experts, and then you had a group of, of novices combined together in an in a engineer, what I would call an engineered system, somewhat like a hive, right? Because a hive is, is a combination of things, right? A hive is, it, it, like a honey hive in, in an apiary is both an engineered box designed to optimize the production of honey but it also brings in the wisdom of the bees themselves, and together it produces something much, um, there's an emergent property that, that de that's derived out of it, and I would say the same happened in that event. Um, there are some problem problems when you take humans and you try to do wisdom of, of crowds, and that is, is that sometimes if the crowd is led by somebody who's not particularly wise or is evil or has evil intent, you can end up going into a completely different direction and the crowd becomes powerful, but a powerful agent for bad, not good. Um, we did a DARPA experiment, this is unpublished data, but we did a series of DARPA experiments where we rigged people up with physiologic monitors and we sent them into this crime scene house in the University of West Virginia and we ran a scenario where they had to, they had to rescue a hostage. We gave the, the, we gave the teams very basic instructions and just like I was talking about with wisdom of crowds. We, we gave no directions about who should be a leader. We didn't designate a leader. We, get, we brought teams of four or five people in. We rigged them up with the physiologic monitors. We gave them a mission. We sent them in the house, and then we measured their physiology. And interestingly enough, when we videoed these and we watched the teams go in, you could very easily see them coalesce on video. You could see them coalesce around a leader. And interestingly enough, 100% of the time, the computers could pick the leader out based on physiologic data. So what do I mean by that? Is that we could actually see the physiology of the leader leading by a few milliseconds the physiology of everybody else, including their, their brain waves, including galvanic skin response, stuff that's happening at a very, very, at a subconscious level, okay? I mean, at the things that are not happening at a conscious level. So we could actually, the machines could tell you who the leader was. And I will tell you this, the word leader in the military is imbued with this, um, it connotes normally in our warrior culture, the idea of leader is normally a good thing. Like nobody would say, oh, leadership is bad. Well, no, leadership's good, leadership's great. A good lead, I mean, being a leader who can lead people, that's a great thing. Well. We saw people emerge as leaders who did a terrible job, who got the team killed, you know, notionally, 
in this crime scene house, um, we were able to see, the machine was able to say, yeah, that person's a leader, but it wasn't able to say, well, that person's a really good leader. <laughs> just say, no, that person leads really well physiologically, but the, but, but the leader very often led people astray. I'm Did curious as you're, as you're saying that when we're thinking about this sort of convergence of data and artificial intelligence and humans as sort of this swarm or hive or engineered system around a problem, uh, as you're continuing to talk, I'm just wondering, do you have ideas of sort of what the regulators of, of sort of the ability <laughs> to make it a good direction, to make it a, a validated and or a decision then that you're confident in? Like as you're thinking about this, this way of creating a system, have you also also thought about how you sort of have the checks and balances? You, di you just stole my th right there. So uh, that, that last line was, so okay. uh, th that's, a, that's a fantastic question. I don't think anybody's worked that out. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great research question. Mm -hmm. But I do think that empirically, the founders of this country threw that into the mix as a, as a way to regulate that, is to have mutually have portions of government that each have their own individual parts but one part of their job is to supervise the other two so that you, and doing it that way. So, but that's something I think would be a great experiment. Mm -hmm. And you could, mo you could do modeling and simulation to sort of sort, sort through of that. Sort of what, do people regulate tech or does tech regulate people or is it a combination? I, I think that's yet to be determined. I, 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 I think that's a, but I th it's an important question though. Because w like it or not, we're heading in this direction. So whether, whether we want to or not, the, these, uh, these combined systems of uh, artificial intelligence and crowds is, ha is happening whether we like it or not. Because the commercial world is driving it. And not necessarily by, by direct intent. By, but it's just m the worlds are colliding. And you'll, you'll see in a slide or two here how that's happening right underneath our noses. So, so the, but there, there are some people who have theorized that there are some ideal prop properties, and this gets to what you were talking about. So diversity of opinion, so not having mono, monolithic thought, independence amongst the actors within the crowd, some degree of de decentralization, but in the end, some degree to aggregate the information within the crowd to, to make it functional. And these are just some, some questions. I'm not going to belabor this. I'm going to move on. Okay. So, um, so many of the um, uh, of America's top, the world's top corporations are really are finding this fundamental question about the the convergence of AI and crowds, or or you know social networks, call it what you want, is is the topic of the day right now, right? I mean, this is really so. This is a this this is an existential potentially an existential threat to the society or an existential opportunity for society to move to its next highest level okay but w whatever it is we're in that revolution right now we're in the midst of it so th so people in this audience are really potentially at the forefront of sort of being the philosophical the thought leaders on how to how to get this right because there is in question whether or not we get it right so um so I'm going to take a step backward a little bit and talk about how, you know, along the commercial space, how w people have tried to harness wisdom of crowds. So, for instance, how many people are familiar with Mechanical Turk? I mean, the, the actual, yeah. So both the historical Mechanical Turk and the me Mechanical Turk. I saw one hand go up. Just I don't know the historical. Oh, okay. Well, oh, good. So I, I still have so, something to teach you. So, so anyway, <laughs> the Mechanical Turk was a, was a device that was built for Napoleon. Actually, if, this is really, this is, this is deeply embedded in the history of robotics and computers. Um, so a, so a, uh, a series of devices, but the, and none of them which survived. So any of the ones that we have are reproductions from dr original engineering drawings. But basically, it was a it was a it was a chess playing, Turkish, looking, robotic chess player. But in but in reality, there was a human. They were usually a little person, 
Okay, so they were genetically, you know, they were about two and a half, three feet tall. And they pulled the controls down here, but they made it look as though this automaton was brilliant and could, could play chess. So this, the, 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 the Amazon engineers who came up with this on Amazon Web Services, who came up with this, this was kind of a wink to the fact that, that Mechanical Turk is basically a, a, a crowdsourcing engine that, and they have up to four, so hits, um, uh, hits are human intelligence tasks. And basically when they're talking about hits, they're talking about available human beings to pull on a project. These guys are used to, I mean, people from all over the planet earn money sitting around in their underwear, whatever, uh, being crowdsourced robots for, um, and they do all sorts of things. There may be somebody in this audience who's been a, been a Turk. They're called Turks, doing Turking. And, and, and basically they do everything from doing surveys to, you know, put, entering, do, doing data entry, like taking, somebody takes a snapshot of a, of a, of uh, handwritten numbers and wants it put into an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. But they can, be brought, they can be brought in in great numbers to do tasks, essentially doing what, um, what computers have difficulty doing is reconciling kind of squishy, soft stuff that uh, there's a lot of questions. It, it, so anyway, it's, a, it, it's artificial, artificial intelligence is what it is. Okay. So, uh, Alan and I were talking about, like, well, is wisdom of crowds just about w words or numbers? Or is there wisdom in activity? Like, if you really look at a beehive, it's not just that the bees are, the bees aren't like guessing the weight of a cow, right? <laughs> The bees are doing other things like cooling their hive or warming their hive or doing other kinds of things. In other words, they're uniting as a group to do a physical task. So they're expressing their wisdom not by spouting out a number, but actually doing something. So this is my challenge one. This is my Carnegie Mellon challenge one. And I would tell you that I've really tried to look to see if anyone's done this. And maybe they have and just not talked about it or published it. But let's take a notional drone experiment where we, where we have a drone, but we have more than one controller. We start off with two people with the exact same controls. And then they, they both simultaneously input th their joystick positions and so on are put and summated and sent to the drone for its actions. Now, now let's put two people doing that with the heads up display. Now let's put three people. Let's f put four people. Let's put five people. Let's put 10 people. Is there a point at which you put a bunch of novice flyers of drones, could they fly a drone as well as one of the Air Force's most highly experienced drone pilots? Meaning, could you just through sheer force of adding novice individuals and summating or br somehow bring that in, or even better, where you have like this Kasparov experiment, and I do call it an experiment, it was an experiment, where you have people of a certain skill level aided by a bunch of people with less skilled level summated where the controls are, are there's more bias given to the inputs of the more experience you have. So that you could bring coalesce crowds around, and I say this now because th there, we're, we're getting into a world now where it's not, just, it's not just all about numbers. We're talking about driverless cars, we're talking about things that do things in the environment, right? I mean, this is a town of Uber, and we know that. So, so I believe, and I, and I don't know this for sure, and I, but I do think it's mathematically determinable that if you, if you take one drone pilot, they fly really well. You put two drone pilots, they, don't, they fly worse. You put three pi drone pilots, you crash the thing all the time. You put four drone pilots, they fly almost as well as two drone pilots. You put five drone pilots, they fly as well as one drone pilot. And you put six drone pilots, and suddenly you're doing better than one drone pilot. You see what I'm saying? Like, I think that there's a sub-optimization before you get to an optimization. 
Like you put in a couple people and it gets wonky. You put more and more, it smooths out and it actually gets better. And of course, as more individuals start learning and their wisdom is input into the crowd, an emergent property of that crowd is better drone flying. So do you have an, a, a hypothesis about ideals or are you hoping that the challenge exposes those ideals? So, bingo, second, because I was in the military and as much as I would like us to fly drones really well and, and stay secure and keep bad guys at bay, um, and I know that lots of people who have the role of designing our next generation drones would love to potentially fund things like that. So ding, 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 if people are interested in this. But I, as a doctor, I have a different, and I'm just about to get to that. Um, but that, but you're, you're way ahead of me on this. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I do have an ulterior motive in understanding that question. And it has to do with something near and dear in my heart, which is back to medicine, right? So, you know, we have robots in surgery. Intuitive Surgical makes the Da Vinci. There's other robots entering the workspace. There's the, the history of robots in medicine is quite checkered. Um, there was a report out about how many 144 patients died during uh, robot surgical procedures, uh, all sorts of accidents, collisions, things that were cut that should have been cut. People die in surgery. And, and, you know, I, I don't mean to say that like robots are bad because if they were, they'd been pulled from the market. But there are some issues with robots that make every, give everybody pause, including the, the kind of idea of, do I really want that robot hand doing a pelvic exam? You know, do I want, you know what I mean? So, um, so anyway, this is, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is Dr. Macedonia doing a scan on Beyonce. And um, no, I, I so, so anyway, he's doing it all wrong. I could, I, I'm not going to tell you why he's doing all wrong, but anyway, ultrasound involves a lot of eye-hand skill, okay? It's, it's a very, very, it's a spooky art in that when I do an ultrasound and I put a probe on somebody, I'm doing two-dimensional imaging in real time, and I, I don't know how my hand does it, but once I get a general understanding of where the fetus is, if I say, I want to look at the cerebellum, my hand just goes there. I, I don't even think about it. It just, it just happens, right? And that's because I've been doing it about 30 years. When I was first doing it, I had to think about every step as I moved the probe and so on. But now that I've been doing it 30 years, it just happens, right? So uh, there are people that have tried to hook up robots to ultrasound probes and do tell, and there's actually a couple patents on, you know, things where you put a cage over somebody and it's very, okay. Well, I think that, I personally think that the best robot hand is probably our hand. But how do you direct our hand to do something better than it knows how to do, than the brain that's connected to it knows how to do? Well, in the rehab world, there's all sorts of devices that connect to the hand that can actually move the fingers and move the hand. I've envisioned, and, and I filed patent on this, not because I'm, like, I personally am going to make a commercial product. I, I don't have the wherewithal to make a commercial product, but I am. But it is kind of a complicated thing that I wanted to be able to speak to people about and, uh, and with a lot of different uh, pieces to it. Um, what I envision is a, a means by which to control the movements of other people with voluntarily, meaning they don't have to do what you're telling them to do if they don't want to do it. What do I mean by that? Um, if I'm doing an ultrasound and the person on the other end wants me to take the probe and smash the person's face with it, if I'm a robot, if I am a straight up no kidding robot, I don't care. I'm a sociopath. All I care about are ones and zeros. I'm going to put my armature straight through that person's face. But if I'm a human and I'm wearing a device that is nudging me, that is cajoling me, that is suggesting to me that my hand move toward the face, then I'm going to go, no, I'm not going to hit that person in the face. I, I'm going to stop. I'm, I'm going to be that safety in the loop. I envision a crowdsourced way of controlling 
whether it's a surgeon hand or aircraft mechanics hand or whatever at a distance using gyroscopic influence. Basically using a glove that has gyroscopes in it that allow the hand to, to, the, to feel like, like, like a magic force that they want to do something. And you can do this with gyroscopic motion. Anybody who's ever played with a toy gyroscope knows this process. So the idea here is that you have a network of reasonably trained, none of these are physicians, but they're reasonably trained in an ultrasound interpretation, each bringing a general knowledge of ultrasound and a specific knowledge about their part, like maybe it's the fetal brain or the fetal kidneys or the fetal heart, and they're part of a hive with a system integrator, and they're able to control either directly through the through the influence of the main, main the, the orchestrator or through a collective movement to be able to basically do ultrasound any point on the planet, any place, any time, any location, doesn't matter. All you need is somebody who knows how to turn an ultrasound machine on, put a glove on, and put a probe to somebody's belly. They don't even really need no ultrasound and they, with a headset, and they can be walked through and by, not by, not by super smart doctor, but by a super smart hive or swarm or crowd or whatever you want to call it, right? And they could do this collectively every, anywhere on the planet that you have that particular thing. That's the kind of telemedicine I envision. Not the super smart doctor telling the person, oh, move the probe to the left or the right or whatever. If you've ever watched teleultrasound being done, they do it for demos for the American Telemedicine Association. But it's all a parlor trick. What I, I don't want parlor tricks. I want things that really substantially change. So is your, idea, is your idea also because by the collective wisdom of the hive, you, you have an opportunity to have better outcomes because there's lots of thinking going on that's then directing the actions. Yeah, and at a minimum, you're getting outcomes to areas that are completely underserved. Two thirds of our country has no access to this to high level ultrasound, the, the kind of skills that Dr. Larkin and myself do at Lancaster mm -hmm. Maternal Fetal Medicine every day because they live in geographically <coughs> remote areas or they live in a place where it's difficult to get to the doctor. Whereas the idea is that, going back to ScanVan or whatever, is that you can take the machines anywhere and that the wisdom, the knowledge of being able to how to do that diagnostic it could be done through a, through a hive located anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, now with low latency communication, I mean, I mean uh, you know, high, high, high bandwidth, low latency communication, you could, you could spot these centers anywhere on the planet. And they could, they could remotely operate not just an ultrasound machine, but do other, other kinds of stuff, breast ultrasound, uh, uh, maybe even minor surgery. Crowds do you have versus crowds assisted by AI and big data for the, the Yeah, so, so, and just like the, just like the, the video I'd shown earlier, there is a devil in the details, okay? Um, the, 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 where the AI comes in is on that particular example. So it's going to be unique to each case, but the way I envision, envision it for this ultrasound example is that the AI is most useful in the image recognition part. The, the people would probably navigate the probe, navigate to the right location. The AI would sift through the image and say, that looks like a, Blake, a Blake's pouch cyst. No, that looks like a Danny Walker malformation, whatever. And then start, in, and, and then tell the master controller, well, because of this, because I see this, now I want you to go to the lower spine and look at this. And the master controller wouldn't necessarily know to do that, but the AI would, right? Based on image recognition and that kind of thing. So, but it's going to be unique to any, there's, there's, no one, there's no one formula for how the AI and the crowd work together. It's really about, because we're talking about an engineered system, there would have to a priori be some very important decision making made about what part of the equation are we going to parse to the AI, what part of the equation are we going to parse to the humans, and then over time there may be a rebalancing of that. There may be a conclusion that
Maybe we should hand this off to the AI as well. Or maybe the AI is performing really poorly on this part. Maybe we should hand that back to the crowd. But it's going to be an engineered solution of some, some sort. It's, there's, there's still going to be a role for, <laughs> for engine, systems engineers in this thing because th there's going to have to be a set of people who really think about how the system looks. So to the point that you made earlier, each situation, each application, really would have to have its own unique set of checks and balances right. that work between the wisdom of humans and the intelligence or the data or whatever it is that are coming together to get to a better outcome. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, here's another challenge or example. Uh, I told you I was going to bite off on big existential problems in medicine. This is one, which is, you know, how do we, how do we, save, how do we save ourselves from ourselves on healthcare spending? And, um, you know, I hope people don't think I'm a little crass there. It's Boxer. You know, I'm, I have a picture that I'm, I'm imagining is Boxer from Animal Farm, uh, my favorite book, my absolute favorite book in the history of, of literature. Um, that's Boxer, you know, laying, laying down, dying of his heart attack, saying, um, I will work harder. The hospital administrators and drug company executives are always right, you know, if, if people know it. Napoleon is always right if, if for friends of the book Animal Farm. Uh, um, we are living in Orwellian times. And one of the problems is that we're just, we're just eating ourselves alive at the cost of health care. And so what the, 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 the mantra is value-based reimbursement. So we're not going to pay for doctors to do procedures or to do X. We're going to pay if they give us value. And if they don't give us value, we're not going to pay them or we're going to pay them less because only the valuable doctors, right? And uh, that sounds great. That's like, yeah, you want to learn how to play the flute? I'll tell you how to play the flute. You blow on one end and you move your fingers up and down the other and that's how you do it, okay? Um, and then, of course, uh, how do you measure value, right? How does one measure value? How do you measure how valuable a doctor is? Well, the people who espouse value-based health care, I'm going to flip through Blaise Pascal here. This is a soup, classic soup sandwich, which, by the way, is a term frequently used in the military. Um, it's a mess. It's a hot mess. So you have, and you know, no, the New England Bible of Medicine has a series of articles talking about the grand value of value-based reimbursements. And they, they cart a, an esteemed Harvard researcher who comes up with genius ideas like, oh, we get rid of all the antitrust laws and let the healthcare corporations aggregate themselves so they'll be these big systems that can get everything right and cure the world of all known diseases. Um, he keeps talking about how we get value. He does, there is a word, some few words of wisdom in his talks. Like he says, we need to measure true health outcomes rather than relying solely on process measures. And what, what he means by that is, okay, it's easy to look at somebody's hemoglobin A1C. And if I look at 100 doctors and I see who drives the hemoglobin A1C level below 5.7 and who doesn't, and I pay the ones more who do drive the hemoglobin A1C level down, well, that sounds pretty reasonable. Well, how do, you, how do you do that with, like, maternal fetal medicine? Do you do it solely based on how many babies live or die? Well, that presupposes that my population is 100% identical to the person's next to me, next to me, and next to me. So there's a lot of vagaries to that, all right? There's a lot of squishiness to it. It's a soup sandwich, all right? Uh, humans are pretty good at discerning value. Now, can anybody, in that, in that picture off to the left, and it's so small, I'm wondering whether or not I should have blown it up. Can anyone tell me what the most valuable item is by far and away? We're talking perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars in that picture. Not a human being, by the way. That's the most valuable object, right? You know, but so, so let's take the humans out of the equation. In that picture, anyone recognize an object that is super valuable? It's actually, it's actually this thing right here. All right. It's the gear to watertight door number six on the Titanic. 
And uh, we brought that up in 2000. And um, despite what you read in National Geographic about, oh, we found new evidence of how the ship went down and so on, that was actually discovered on my Mir 14 mission in 2000. So they, they sat on that information for like 12 years before they decided to tell the public. I don't have enough time to explain. But anyway. That's, a, that's an, an unfair tease, I think. I'll tell you That's afterwards. a big story. I know that okay. we have a class coming in. <laughs> so anybody who's watched the movie Titanic, you know, there's a scene in the movie where Mr. Andrews says, he rolls out Titanic, and he looks, and he's counting the watertight compartments, and he looks at that, and he, does it, and he goes, it's a mathematical certainty the ship's going to go down. And then he barks out some orders to the engineers. Well, the orders he, he gave to the engineers, the orders he gave to the engineers was open up watertight door number six. It'll balance the ship out. The ship will sink for a while this way before it will have catastrophic failure and go like this. Okay, and he actually ran the numbers in his head. He built the ship. He designed the ship. It was the most, it was the most complicated, most advanced engineered system ever envisioned by human beings. And the poor guy had to go on his maiden voyage and die with it. But anyway, and it wasn't his fault. But, but, um, but in any case, he told the engineers to open up watertight door number six. Well, what happens when it reaches a critical point? Watertight door number six flew, blew, blew wide open. The ship took on water very fast, and within two minutes, 1,500 souls dead. And it was a very dramatic scene. And, and, and Jim Cameron tried to recreate that in the movie. Um, that's the gear to watertight door number six. That's the proof that it was. It's stamped with watertight door number six serial numbers on it. It was watertight door number six. It, it confirmed the story that that's what he did, and that's how it proved the theory that that's the way the ship went down. Anyway, probably the most important artifact ever brought up from Titanic, and it doesn't even look all that impressive. Okay, just because I know we're running out of time. Um, so the way I see us being able to figure out value-based reimbursement is that we have the AI crank through the numbers. So the AI is able to make, a, make an initial assessment about volume, outcome, total numbers of patients, complexity of patients using standard scoring systems like an Apache score or whatever. But in the end, you have to have checks and balances. The check and balances is that you have the wisdom of crowds. And you don't necessarily need doctors to do that. You need, you need reasonably educated people or people to a su sufficient level. And they supervise the numbers and come up with value. Humans are good at valuing things that computers aren't necessary because we add an emotional level, emotional component to it. Um, and then I just want, because we're running out of time, I want to just talk about a passion of mine, which is that it's ridiculous that, the, that this nation, the largest economy on the planet, the richest nation on the planet, the, 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 I mean, this great country has such horrible, appalling maternal and infant mortality rates. It is awful. It's a crime. It's sinful. How many, how many adjectives can I use for this? I, we also spend a crap ton on wearables and other toys and gadgets. But in those toys and gadgets, I want to remind everybody, this is a minim minimalist list of, of things that are in the sensor packages inside the Samsung watches are probably twice that of the Apple Watch, okay? There's all sorts of sensor, sensor packages, that, and they could be leveraged without much. What, what we, we don't need is new sensor packages. Um, what we need are people who are willing to write the apps and the APIs to interface with the already existing sensor packages in devices like the Apple Watch or other wearables and have some type of, st this is a Dexcom glucose sensor, but something similar where we put that on a mom's belly and it's able to sense when a fetus is getting in trouble and when they're not so that moms don't have to do kick counts, so we're not doing the ridiculous weekly biophysical profile scanning which is, which is very weak at figuring out whether or not a kid's in trouble combined wisdom of crowds and the AI. So the AI sorts through the information. And anybody's familiar with the controversy going on right now with the heart rate sensor on the Apple Watch, if I had Apple executives in the room, I would tell them what you need to do is somewhere in the loop, you have to have humans reviewing what the machine is interpreting off the watch to put a check on 
uh, you know, whether or not the watch is giving a false positive or not. Because there is a real hazard. False positives are no joke. False positives run up the price of health care. False positives can kill people through unnecessary tests and complications from those tests. So I would, this is the third challenge, and this is the one I probably have the most passion for, and that's I wish somebody would work with me on trying to figure out how we come up with a flight data recorder for pregnancy that's non-invasive and is able to prevent children from dying unnecessarily because we can't monitor their pregnancies appropriately. It kills me how much money we spend on stupid things. I mean, really stupid things in healthcare. You know, we have drugs on the market that cost $500,000 a year that are specifically designed around, not to be an ageist here, but specifically designed around keeping people in their late 60s alive two, three years. So yeah, society gets to blow about $2 million on keeping somebody in their late 60s alive. And yet, we have a difficult time with, with, you know, we wonder why young women aren't getting pregnant. We wonder why our birth rates are dropping. We wonder why people are choosing not to have big families. We wonder that, but we're not willing to spend the money on the most important thing a society can do, which is bring in new life into the world and raise children. So uh, I, I told you it wasn't just going to be a technology talk. It was also going to be me being sanctimonious and preachy and whatever you want to call it. But I just, I just, it's, I think it's, I think it's criminal that we have such terrible maternal infant mortality and morbidity rates in this country and I'm passionate about solving that problem. So anyway, that's it. That's my, my thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>